And it just became a chore because sometimes it was so difficult to communicate. But in the beginning, in the first week, it was very difficult. I would say within the third week of filming, just as someone in production, I would sit back and I would look at these guys who don't necessarily speak the same language and the way they interact and like the camaraderie which they had. It was truly beautiful and gave me hope and humanity. It was amazing to watch. Like some guy who barely speaks French, you know, communicating with some guy who speaks only English and yet they have like a bond which is growing. It was like, I felt like I had done something good for the world doing this film, whatever comes of it or not. That's amazing. That sounds like the bonding experience of renting out this house in Yaoundé and bringing together people from all different cultures, languages, that exchange. It sounds like the process of making it was just extraordinary. Tell us some, about some of the other difficulties you faced on the ground, technically, legally, permits. When you shoot a guerrilla film, for the most part, permits go out the window. Especially shooting within Cameroon, you need to have two permits one signed by the National Registry, and you can't get that on the ground. You need at least six months ahead of time to get that permit. And then from there, you have to have a dossier which you show every uh, official who comes by and asks you. But once they see this paper, they will immediately walk away from you and not say a word. Now, as a result of not having this... Neither. I, you had neither. I had neither. I, I wanted to, I attempted to get it uh, three months before we landed in the country, but then I realized it was going to be impossible. I got into the country, went around um, from office to office, and officials were afraid to put their name on anything artistic because it could be critical of the government. And even then, when I sat in the Ministry of Tourism, the Ministry of Entertainment, the Ministry of Arts, no one would give me a definitive answer. They'd always push me off to someone else. I literally went within the center of Yaoundé to a government officials' offices, sat there, explained that I was making an art film, but no one wants to green light something which could be critical of a dictatorship. So as a result, they were like, okay, listen, you're in the wrong office. You need to go to the office of entertainment, you need to go to the office of arts, you need to go to the office of this, that, and that. You know, so it was very difficult. At a certain point, I realized that, you know what? I had come prepared for this. I had gone with Kinko's and I had made up fake documents in order to uh, come off a little bit legitimate because the, the average soldier is not gonna waste his time like calling and trying to find out if you're actually official or not. They're gonna see quote unquote foreigners, white people, and, and a bunch of guys with expensive equipment and just gonna like uh, be appeased. So uh, that worked out for the majority of the film. We essentially would just come into an area three, four hours ahead of time, which we had located, picked out. Uh, our line producer, Gislaine Amoku, had worked it out, and most people where we were shooting assumed that this was gonna be an African film. But then when they started seeing like the foreigners come, that's when it's like, okay, um, the bribes would uh, suddenly uh, be demanded, the, the, they would tax us for random things all of a sudden. So it was a little bit of a headache. Our biggest hurdle was our very last day of the shoot where uh, I don't want to give away too much about the film, but we shot, we lived in the shadow of the National Football Stadium. And it's a poor area, but there's like beautiful homes within this area. And our house was really nice, but it has like 12 foot walls and a courtyard. So we went out and it was right next to our home. We go out and we're filming in the shadow of the National Stadium. It looks amazing, really cool shot. But at a certain point, a local uh, police regiment had been patrolling and then they saw this. And I thought nothing of it. Marching in his complete uh, uniform, which is, it looks like uh, it looks like a soldier, but he's actually a police officer, he's a gendarme. The gendarme officer sees us, and then he walks away. And I thought, oh, nothing's gonna happen. He just like saw that we were shooting a film or shooting something. Literally, as we finished, within a minute of our final shot, we're about to clap. All of a sudden, a car shows up. Five soldiers pull out of nowhere. And then they're just like, okay, everyone, everyone, put away the cameras. You're all under arrest. Who has the permit? Who's responsible here? Everyone at that moment turns and they just point to me. And I'm like, <laughs> what is going on here? I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this is going on. These guys, like all of a sudden they're like, who do you know? 
when did you get the permit? And I'm like telling them, like, listen, I'm not gonna show them the fake permit at this point because I'm gonna get myself in even more trouble. So I tell them that, listen, I have a permit, but we were just doing our last shoot. I didn't know that I needed to have it here. It's at the house. And he's like, okay, you all are under arrest and you have to come down to the station and we'll sort this down at the station. But the thing is, they were afraid, I believe, of like arresting the foreigners. So they didn't arrest us, but every African in the crew, they put them inside of the cars and then they marched them into the, the police station. So me, the director, the cinematographer, the sound guy, we were walking, we, ha we walked to the police station. In a it was a parade, everyone who was on set, we essentially walked in a parade to the, this, uh, to the police station. And if I had known what I knew now, I would have told like the Brazilians maybe to like just disappear at that point because there was no pressure. The cinematographer Victor was smart enough to like disappear. You never saw him. He, he went was Argentine. No, he was uh, he was from Brazil. He was from Sao Paulo, but he literally he went back into the house and he he never had to deal with the craziness that we did because we got into the station and once we got into only the, the Africans. Only the Africans were in the cells. And you're included, even though you're American. You're I, yeah, I, they didn't search me because they listen to the way I talk and they know I'm not from there. You know, so even my connections or whatever, they they knew I wasn't from there. So I sat there. I'm listening to them, and the most interesting thing about this whole process was we had this um, gendarme captain who comes in, you know, really bloated guy, like fat pot belly. His uniform is hanging, but it's like, you know, has all these medals and medallions, like he's accomplished so much. We've never been at war. I don't know what these medals are for, but he's in front of us and he sits there. And then he like goes to the Brazilian, like, what's your name? We're all fingerprinted, We're, they take our pictures, and then they give uh, ask for our statements as to who we are, they document everything. And in Cameroon, it's not like this is done by computer. So literally a guy is sitting there by hand writing up these documents, like, like detailing exactly who we are. And at a certain point, we're all put into a room and we have to explain the movie to this captain. And then on top of that, we rehashed our last month, what we've been doing the entire time we've been in the country. So it was like a crazy wrap up to our whole story about like explaining like who we are, what we've done. I tell him I'm a filmmaker, the lead director, um, Marco Mateos, he tells him he's a filmmaker. He's done numerous commercials in Brazil. And then the captain looks over at all of us and like, these are not real jobs. What do you guys do? And it was like, no, this is what we do. And it was like very dismissive of the arts. He's like, no, no, no. You build something. You, you, you found it so hard to believe that people do art. And I'm like, yeah, it was, it was just crazy. So did he expect you to be scammers? What was his? He thought you were drug dealers. He what thought was we were Boko Haram. He thought we were Boko Haram. And he, well, that was the premise. I, I, I gathered really quickly that they were more interested in trying to get a bribe or get some kind of a payment out of us than actually uh, surmising what we were doing in the country because it was just like, oh, I don't know you guys, you're making films in Cameroon and you have military uniforms, you're impersonating police officers, this could be something against the government, you could be Boko Haram, this could be a Boko Haram publicity video, I don't know what this is. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, look, sir, you have a couple white guys from America, some guys from Brazil, like who's making a Boko Haram video? You have to look at this rationally. He smiled and he knew in his heart of hearts, he knew what this was. This was a shakedown, any way you want to look at it. But, you know, he had to go through the whole protocol. I'm like, sir, come on, you know what this is. And then eventually, when things were at dire worst, we had been in the station for about eight hours. Eight hours of this. I'm sitting at night, there. The middle of the night? The middle of the night. We, our shoot was so tight, the Brazilians had a flight out of the country at 2, p, at 2 a.m. in that morning. So right now, this is about 10, and they have to be out of the country. The end of your month. Completely, completely. completely. I thought we would have had time to have at least a barbecue as a crew. None of that. This was the end. So we're sitting in this police station in these dire circumstances. The actors are in the cell, the extras, the people who were there. And you still had 5% of the filming left to do, or you were pretty much done the filming? We were done. Yeah, right. We literally, the very last shot we had. So we lucky in a sense that it happened at the very end instead of the beginning of the middle. I don't know if it was luck. I think it was more God looking after us or what. But yeah, I guess we were very fortunate that it happened. But Then you had to pay 
So are you allowed to say whether you needed to cough up some dollars? Oh, absolutely. Dollars? Absolutely. I had to cough up dollars. Like I gave, um, I, I was able to make a phone call. When I made a phone call to my cousin, um, who's like politically connected, he had a high-ranking uh, police officer come by and do uh, sp speak for us about letting us go. And at that point, the captain said we have to wait for the colonel to show up. There was a point where things were getting very serious. A captain shows up, a colonel, excuse me, a colonel, gendarme officer, the colonel shows up at maybe 10.30. At that point, we're all made to rise. Everyone stands at attention. This is like very serious. He comes all Africans. in, all Africans. He comes in with like four or five other guys, and then we're led into another office. And I'm like, listen, I'll do the talking for everyone. So he sits down at the desk. He has all of our passports in front of him. How many nations? Cameroonians, Cameroonians, Nigerians, Angolans, Cameroonians, uh, Angolans, Americans. He has our passports in front of him, and. He talks to me for a second. I'm doing all the talking for everyone because I, I, I'm the producer. I'm responsible. I tell them, listen, um, we'd like to be freed. We, we, I'm sorry. If there, is there any way we can work this out? And the way these bribes work is it's a dance. You can't just like get, offer money. No, you have to go through the pageantry of, well, this is what you've done. This is how you know you've made me feel. This is how you've broken the law. And then afterwards, we might be able to. In the beginning, working on the streets, I, I, I would meet people and I'm like, I don't even want to deal with it, just take the money. And they'd almost be offended that I would give them the money rather than talk. It's part of the dance. If you interrupt the step, they become insulted. So this is one thing I learned about dealing in African uh, bribery, scam republic. You know, you essentially have to like go through the whole pageantry, the whole process of it. And then you offer them something. It's part of it. They tell you how serious your offense is and how grave the situation is and then you slowly appease. But if you interrupt the step, you start all over again. In a sense, that is the dark comedy of it. You created this meta experience where you actually were living out the scam because the police were scamming you the shakedown as a result of you filming this thing. And that's such an amazing sort of postmodern commentary on what you're covering. Tell us a little bit about the documentary aspect of this project. You have the film that you're going to be touring around at festivals, but then you also have a second tangential project, which is itself a really core part of it, the documentary sort of making of. Essentially, we have over 32 hours of footage, which we shot randomly within our compound and throughout Yaoundé, where we were filming. And it's just to illustrate camaraderie, which um, we as a crew had built from relatively nothing. I mean, these are people coming from vast array walks of life, but we all have the fact that we love the arts. We all, you know, enjoy music, comedies, theater. And just based on those few things alone, we were able to form something which was truly beautiful. It was an unofficial UN, as I would like to call it. Just, just something which is completely organic, uh, without any real representation in the world. And that's essentially what I documented in the making of Scam Republic. I took a lot of, uh, I took some shots of the film. Not that many shots of actually the core footage, because I wanted to save that for festivals, but I, I took a lot of shots which might entice people to want to see the film, because they're like, where is that place? I've never seen something that looks like that. Some people just thought it was crazy because, you know, they, their reality is so far removed from Africa that they've never even seen, like, you know, red soil, which is everywhere, you know, that in itself is something which is unique. And someone mentioned that to me and I was like, wow, you've never seen red soil, you haven't lived. It's a 30 minute making of video, which is currently on YouTube. It's called Scammed, Making of Scam Republic. And uh, most of our actors are featured, all of our actors are featured in it. In the Scam Republic, 